Um, I have with me Dimitri Babich. Dimitri, I had the very pleasant experience of going to dinner with recently and mm-hmm. having a long talk about Julian's situation. So I'm very pleased that he's going to, uh, that he's joining us here today. Dimitri is an accomplished and long-standing journalist. You will often see him on Peter Lavelle's show Crosstalk. I believe they just filmed yet another episode of that today. You can look up Crosstalk on YouTube and, and see Dimitri and Peter's work. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dimitri. <laughs> Yes, nice to see you. And uh, besides uh, being on Crosstalk and cooperating with RT, I have been a journalist covering Russian and international affairs for how many? Oh, almost 29 years. I have been working in the uh, central media, as we call it, in Russia since 1989, including such newspapers as uh, the Moscow News or Moskovsky Novosti in Russian, Ria Novosti, uh, uh, you know, uh, on different uh, in different uh, stages of its history. Also in Komsomolska Pravda, which used to be included in the Guinness Book of Records as the newspaper, as a daily with the largest circulation in the world. And I can tell you as a journalist uh, that uh, I felt a pleasant shock uh, when Julian Assange appeared on the world media stage. I I simply could not imagine that just one person with a small team of devoted people, not on salary, you know, for a very small amount of money, managed to change the tide of history, change the tide of news. You know, Uh, I have been a journalist in the pre uh, kind of uh, uh, pre-internet times. Uh, 20 years of my work were in the pre-internet times, right? Uh, and and I simply could not imagine that uh, this is uh, uh, you know uh, this is uh, possible. Uh, Julian managed to do it with a handful uh, a handful of supporters, which gradually grew into something bigger. Uh, but he managed to do it, and uh, and that's why, as a journalist, I admire him. I admire him from a professional point of view, if you want. Absolutely. He has set the standard for journalism worldwide. I think it's John Pilger who actually who actually said that. The reason that journalists hate him is because he's doing what they're supposed to do. Exactly. And uh, Julian Pilger, uh, the reason why I ultimately went to work after working for many years, first in the Russian liberal media uh, and then uh, on television, the reason why I went to work on uh, what was called then uh, basically, the uh, you know uh, the voice of Russia, our radio, which later became Sputnik. Uh, it was because John Pilger spoke to uh, Voice of Russia, and I immediately realized that he was a real hero, a real journalist. He was talking about real problems. Uh, he actually told me, uh, uh, you know, John Pilger told our radio an amazing story uh, about his experience in Afghanistan. So with friends like that. Uh, Julian is certainly one of the world's greatest journalists today. Hello? Dimitri, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's just started. Sorry. Sometimes my camera will disappear from your view, but I'm still right here with you. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I hope am, you heard me about John Pilger. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I am actually going to have to shut the windows because it's just started pouring down with rain. So I I'm going to step away for a second. But, But I just wanted to ask you, Dimitri, please, you told me a brilliant historical story about another exile in an embassy, and I had never, ever heard about that before. I was wondering if you could please tell us the story that there is, in fact, precedent for Mm -hmm. Julian's situation in the embassy, in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, Well, let me tell you this story, and it will show you who are the real predecessors of the people who are now chasing uh, Julian Assange, trying to arrest him. There was a cardinal, you know, the head of the Catholic Church in Hungary. His his second name was Mincenti. Uh, In 1956, when the Soviet troops moved into Hungary, he took refuge in the U.S. Embassy in Budapest. And he couldn't leave that embassy for many years afterwards. Uh, I think only in the early 70s, the Soviets let him go. Uh, the problem was that the Americans were ready to give him political asylum on their territory, but he needed to make that way between the American embassy and the airport. 
and it was simply impossible. So he stayed indoors uh, for, I guess, about 15 years. And that's the only precedent that we have for Julian Assange. So when, when uh, uh, the, the mainstream media in the West now compares Russia to the Soviet Union, you guys are wrong. You are the early Soviet Union. You are the worst form of Soviet Union. I mean, the, the current US ideology and the current ideology of the European Union, they remind me in many ways, uh, not even the last years of the Soviet Union, you know, when it was a pretty humane country under Gorbachev, they remind me of the early years of the Soviet Union. At the times when people like Cardinal Mincenti could not leave the American embassy in Budapest. I hope that story uh, went went down well, and I hope you, you you heard me all the time. Yeah, I just I I actually I actually would like to recap it just a little bit for people because I want them to fully understand the significance of what you just said. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling us is that there was a Soviet dissident who sought refuge politi for political no, asylum. Not a Soviet, a Hungarian. Sorry, a Hungarian, my, uh, my apologies. The head of the uh, uh, Hungarian uh, author, uh, sorry, Catholic Church, who took part in the anti-Soviet rebellion in 1956, which is recognized now in Russia as a just rebellion. Uh, our you know, uh, head of Senate, uh, Sergei Mironov, visited Hungary recently on the anniversary of that revolution and congratulated them. So we are kind of, we are excusing ourselves for what happened uh, then. You know, the problem is with the United States and with the, the EU, which never excuse themselves for Iraq, uh, for Libya, for Syria, for all the people that they made miserable in the last few years, right? So Russia excused itself, uh, or the Soviet Union, for what the Soviet Union did in 1956. In 1956, a Hungarian, uh, anti-communist campaigner, the cardinal of the Hungarian Catholic Church, had to stay in the American embassy. He took refuge there because the Soviet troops and the communist police were after him, right? He took refuge in that embassy in 1956, and he stayed there for 15 years. So uh, I hope uh, Julian will not have to stay that long uh, because we live in an internet age now and we can campaign on his behalf. But it tells you very well who are the real predecessors of the people who are now after Julian Assange. Their predecessors are not uh, the great liberal democracies of the West that we all remember and that are dead now. Their, their real predecessors are the Soviet communist totalitarian totalitarian officials who, who put Cardinal Mincenti in that situation when he had to stay indoors for 15 years simply because he couldn't get to the airport. You know, the problem was that the United States gave him political asylum, but he could not make the way between the, the American embassy and the airport in Budapest. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. So, as you say, the U.S. empire is, in fact, exhibiting the same behaviours that previous regimes had exhibited against dissidents previous wanting to... Totalitarian regimes. Totalitarian yeah. regimes. The one that did not tolerate any kind of uh, dissent. The one, uh, you know, I, I, that's what I, I tell the Russians now uh, to the best of my ability. And, and that finds a very sympathetic audience here. As you might know uh, from your experience here, Russians have a very high opinion of the Western states, of the United States, of Western Europe. Uh, these are our spiritual brothers, if you know, because most of the Russian population, we came from the West, you know, West Slavs, who came from the uh, Danube uh, Delta, from the Mediterranean. So they are our spiritual brothers. Uh, the, the image of these countries is very good. And it's very hard for me as a journalist to explain to Russians why do we have such hostility from the United States? Why do we have such hostility from the European Union? And I explained to them that it's not nations who are against us. This is a terrible, ultra-liberal ideology, which has become almost as totalitarian as the communist ideology in its worst years, in the 20s or in the 30s. Uh, you know, so you think, um, wouldn't it be fair to say, Dimitri, that wherever you have people with great wealth and great power, that they have a vested interest in maintaining that great wealth and that great power, regardless of what the nation is? I think this applies also to intelligence services around the world. They uh, have a very vested interest in maintaining their own supremacy 
and that when you get someone like Julian who exhibits incredible courage and willingness to tackle that great wealth and that great power and acts in a way that undermines it, that you this is the net result, regardless of whether it's a you know past Soviet regime or a, a American well, current American empire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I agree with you in principle, but uh, I would say that we have a very special situation here because, okay, there are inequalities and there is hierarchy everywhere in the world, in every human society, okay? Everywhere you will have the army, you will have the secret services, uh, wherever you have a state. But uh, the problem with the modern United States, with the modern European Union, is that they have a very intolerant, uh, very, I would say, aggressive uh, ideology. Uh, if you look at its origins, you know, if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, there were three ideologies that basically challenged the established Christian order in Europe. These were nationalism, socialism, and liberalism. And there, all three of them are okay if they're applied in limited amounts. Uh, but unfortunately, all three of them had terrible offsprings. You know, nationalism driven to an extreme, that was Nazi Germany. Uh, socialism driven to, uh, to wild forms, to an extreme, that was Stalin's Soviet Union. Now we have the great old liberal democracies of the West, the United States, France, Britain, Germany, the European Union. We have them exhibiting a very twisted, ugly, uh, extremist form of liberalism, you know. When certain sound ideas, such as gender equality, such as feminism, such as uh, uh, you know respect for elections, they are driven to an extreme and twisted beyond recognition. I mean, uh, I'm all for elections, but the problem with the modern U.S. government and especially with the government of Mr. Obama or with the European Union is that they only recognize and support the elections where their supporters win. <laughs> They simply cannot reconcile themselves to the fact that in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro may have won, that in Russia, Putin has won an honest election, that uh, in Italy, you know, the, the new uh, governing coalition doesn't want to have a pro-EU prime minister. So they cannot put up with that. You know, they are ready to use uh, violence. They are ready to use lies in order to undermine these governments. And Julian Assange simply exposed it, you know. He did not uh, wage any campaigns against uh, this ideology. He did not target specific uh, Western officials, you know. He just showed it, <laughs> publishing that's the documents, really, you that's know, a publishing really, things that they didn't reveal. That's a, that's a and, wonderful, and then brought them wonderful point. That's a wonderful point, Dimitri, because the, the methodology um, of those who do subvert democratic elections. And I'm thinking now actually a document that WikiLeaks published, which proved that the New Zealand human intelligence assets of our secret service in New Zealand were dispatched to France by the CIA. The dispatch documents came from the CIA to the New Zealand government, to our security services. And they specifically stated they wanted our human intelligence spies to infiltrate all of the polit major political parties involved in the French election. So these guys, when they want to subvert elections, they do it economically, they do it politically, they do it via infiltration and via subversion and sabotage. Now, WikiLeaks does not employ any of those tactics. WikiLeaks is not economically or politically undermining these democrat elections. It's not, infiltrating, it's not infiltrating the parties. It's not using agents. It's not using subversion or sabotage. So we see that the really dastardly con um, conduct is actually not on the part of WikiLeaks at all, but on the part of the intelligence agencies and these, and these governments. Well, I mean, if you look at certain things that are happening in the West now, they remind me of the worst years of the Soviet Union. And... and Julian simply showed it. I mean, when uh, when uh, a U.S. official is uh, is basically thrown out of his job and his life is destroyed because he talked to a, a Russian ambassador and did, did not report it in full to his superiors, we had a similar story in the Soviet Union. The wife of Vyacheslav Molotov, you know, this, the, the number two person in the state after Stalin, his wife talked to the Israeli ambassador and that was enough to get her in jail, right? 
But we hope that such things happened in our country in the years like 1949 and 1953. We couldn't imagine that they could happen in the United States today, you know, or something similar could happen. But those practices, and, but those practices have become institutionalized within governments. Well, particularly. That's the most terrible thing. And, and, and these practices, they can only be practiced in some kind of secret because uh, this new ideology, ultra-liberalism, it is very hypocritical. You know, Nazism was open brutality. Communism was hypocrisy. You know, all nice slogans, uh, proletarian solidarity, you know, helping the poor, uh, liberating enslaved peoples, uh, but in reality, a lot of cruelty. So this new uh, form of totalitarian ideology, ultra-liberalism, is even more hypocritical than the Soviet Union. They talked about the rights of women. They talk about the need to fight rape. Uh, for what, you know? For invasions. And then they, just, and then they the just destroy Libya. Julian, exactly. Assange, Julian Assange put a classic tweet out um, a while ago, and he said, if you want to protect women, Stop mm -hmm. dropping bombs. Stop dropping bombs on them. Absolutely. We all remember. We all remember how how before the invasion of Iraq in 1991, I studied at the United States at the time. How the media was full of reports about Saddam and his people uh, raping women. You know. Then we had the same story repeating itself before the invasion in Libya. And, and Julian simply, I mean, he did not argue with these people. <laughs> he just showed similarities. He just showed the amount of hypocrisy. And, and this is what they can't forgive him because they can only operate in secret. Uh, if you juxtapose facts and their slogans, you immediately have a, a destructive effect on their ideology. That's what John Pilger did, you know. He, in, in one of his uh, texts for, uh, for The Voice of Russia, he just compared, you know, a, a program in which Hillary Clinton explained how much she suffered because of Clinton's marital infidelity, how you have to forgive and let others forgive, and how all that happened uh, right on the same day when he visited an Afghan family, uh, which was bombed, you know, and, and the, all the children died on the orders of that same Hillary Clinton. And these people, no one is talking to, to them. No one is asking if they can forgive, right? Even though they went through something much worse than Mrs. Clinton had to go through watching the pictures of her husband with Monica Lewinsky, right? So exposing that hypocrisy is, is very important. And that's what Julian has been doing. And that's what they cannot forgive him. And there's a wonderful quote from Julian that says that if wars can be started by lies, then peace can be started by truth. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think that it's much easier to prevent a war by telling the truth than having to destroy the aggressor. We all remember how uh, basically Nazi Germany was a, a weak baby state in 1933 and 1934 when Hitler just came to power. If, if all the truth about his actions and about his intentions had been justly reported uh, by the Western media, the Soviet media was already very negative, probably we wouldn't have to destroy his regime at the cost of uh, tens of millions of lives uh, between 1939 and 1945. It's much cheaper to, to expose uh, the aggressive, deceitful regimes before they start killing other people in other countries or in their own country. That's what Julian said. Basically, today the internet gives us an opportunity at a very low cost to, to, to spread the truth, you know, uh, to, to billions of people. It's like, you know, okay, we have all of these dreadful weapons. We have the atomic bomb. We have all kinds of uh, hideous, hideous weapons, you know, that, uh, you know, like robots. Uh, but thank God we also have a very strong medicine against the war. We have internet which can immediately inform billions of people uh, independent of what uh, the government uh, or whether the government wants it or not, right? So Julian has shown this ability of internet to inform people and, and to destroy wars. That's why the weapons producers, that's why the warmongers want to silence him because for them, it's like non-proliferation of truth, you know. If there are other people like Julian Assange, 
uh, like uh, like uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, look, I mean, there are no more heroes. These two really stand out. Why? Because the United States government and the EU have done everything possible to make these people miserable, so that no one would prefer. Uh, to repeat their experience. Look how they are chasing uh, uh, Edward Snowden. Look how, how they are after Julian Assange. The, the, the aim is uh, to kind of uh, to penalize the pioneers so that the others would not venture down the same road. I think that's an incredibly good point, which is that what Julian has done is actually... It, he's extremely intelligent, extremely talented, and, and has had this conversion, uh, convergence of various skills and experiences which led him into his position. However, fundamentally, the methods that he used to get this information out could be done by anybody. And in fact, we can, in that sense, all become in our own way Julian Assange. Well, true. And uh, I just loved, uh, I mean, I, I'm being ironic, of course, yeah, I just loved the way uh, the warmongering general uh, uh, Wesley Clark, how he wanted to attack Assange in the American press and how he said, Assange is not a journalist. Assange is an activist. Well, I don't care how you call a person. Martin Luther King, was he an activist? Was he a preacher? Was he a priest? Was he a journalist? He was all of that at once. <laughs> but the main thing is not what you call a person. The main thing is not a person's credentials. The main thing is the cause for which this person is, is uh, acting, you know, sometimes risking his or her life. Uh, Julian Assange uh, is, is pursuing a very noble cause. He is protecting us from the weapons which our governments have been creating for decades. His uh, campaign to expose the cruelty of the Iraqi war I think it was very important. I mean, now, uh, now thousands of people in the United States who promoted the Iraqi war, who voted for it in the Congress, right? Who wrote uh, uh, aggressive articles about Iraq and about the terrible Saddam. Now they themselves say that the Iraqi war was a mistake. And who was saying that the Iraqi war was a, uh, war was a mistake when it was still going on? Julian Assange, right? And if you a few countries, a few government leaders, including the president. Uh, I mean, I don't agree with him on many points in internal policy, but I think Putin's opposition to the war in Iraq, Putin's opposition to the Western interventions in Libya and Syria, they are absolutely indisputable. Uh, I think anti-war. I think that fundamentally, every human being of good conscience is anti-war. I think. Absolutely. Just imagine if the mainstream media were actually airing anti-war messages instead of pro-war messages. Imagine how easily we would be mobilizing tens of millions of people in support of the anti-war movement. But instead, we see the mechanisms of state acting to undermine anti-war efforts and acting in support of militarism and, and particularly this new uh, corporate element of militarism where we have these private security com uh, companies, you know, the essentially private militia even contracting to military and government around the world. I believe people fundamentally, instinctually, do not want to have bombs dropped on their head, do not want to invest in this, this war industry. Um, well, but we are, we are conditioned to the opposite by the media and to a certain extent, by um, academics as well. Well, I mean, uh, Julian, I think what he did, uh, sometimes he was just pointing to some obvious things because the, the most uh, uh, damning evidence against the modern Western governments, especially the US and the European Union, these things are not secret. <laughs> you don't have to investigate. I mean, uh, the Ukrainian President Poroshenko, who came to power as a result of a violent coup, uh, when his soldiers were uh, on, on offensive in Donbass, when, uh, you know, on that summer when 9,000 people died as a result of the war, he was touring the United States, Canada, and the European countries, and everywhere he had standing ovations, standing ovations in the U.S. Congress, in the Canadian Parliament, in the parliaments of European countries, and they just couldn't 
I mean, I couldn't tolerate this. I mean, okay, maybe you believe that Russia is partially to blame for that, but you are applauding uh, the leader of a country which is killing uh, 9,000 of its citizens. What is the meaning of applause? It means we love it, we want more of it. What do you love about Poroshenko? You love 9,000 people killed by, by the Ukrainian army? Dimitri, you want more? Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you, Dima. Um, there is the same types of injustice that you are describing there that is currently evident in almost every country on this earth. The WikiLeaks Global Intelligence Files are a fantastic example of that. Even in my own country, we have been undermined politically and economically by US empire. But this is certainly happening across entire continents. But what I really, really want to focus on, and maybe I didn't make this clear enough with you in the, um, in the beginning, the, we have managed to do something completely unprecedented with this event that I have not seen done anywhere else. We have managed to in a environment, a, a political and media environment, which is so divided and so divided by ideology and with everybody boxed into their little silos and set against each other, this event has managed to bring people with completely opposing viewpoints, people who would never usually be seen together in public or work together or have anything to do with each other, or even talk to each other. We have managed to bring all of these people from the full political spectrum together in the, for the singular purpose of advocating for Julian, the preservation of Julian's human rights, the restoration right. of Julian's human rights, and for the UK and the US government to respect international law and the decisions of the UN and to end Julian's arbitrary detention in the Ecuadorian embassy. You're absolutely right. I would also I would, say, too, that, that um, there are serious press freedom issues for the entire media sphere um, as a result of the persecution of Julian and of WikiLeaks. Uh, and also, yeah, really, this is it. It's the, the human rights and the press freedom aspect uh, are what really need to be amplified at this stage. You're absolutely right. I would also add not only the US government, not only the UK government, but the Swedish government and the Swedish court should show at least some vestiges of objectivity. I mean, that story is ludicrous uh, about rape uh, and about uh, poor, uh, uh, poor England having to extradite Julian Assange to that powerful country named Sweden. Uh, the other important actor here is, of course, Ecuador. I think the new government of Ecuador should show at least some kind of continuity with the previous government. I mean, uh, Lenin Moreno, uh, he is, after all, a former campaigner on many humanistic issues. So uh, giving up uh, to the UK government a person who obviously, obviously will face unfair treatment, this is simply wrong, this is simply cruel. I mean, if Ecuador is going to be remembered for something in the 21st century, Ecuador has a chance to be remembered for giving refuge to Julian Assange. That is their chance at making history. I think Lenin Moreno should not, simply should not waste that chance because he may go down in history as the president who, who kind of bucked to pressure. And that's not the best, no, that's not the best legacy that you can leave. Uh, uh, at the helm of such a country as Ecuador. And so, absolutely, are, Ecuador, right. Ecuador has been so brave up until this point. They have been extremely brave for such a small... It reminds me, I was just discussing before with Cassandra about how New Zealand stood up against the US and kicked the new, US nuclear warships out in the 80s and out of New Zealand territorial waters and ultimately left the Five Eyes Intelligence agree, um, Agreement as a result. And um, I see the same thing with Ecuador. Ecuador is like the little country that could. You know, they were so small, Absolutely. and yet, Absolutely. yet they have been able. They've been able to assert their national sovereignty on the world stage and to do something truly, truly historic. So I totally Absolutely. agree with you. And it yeah. should be. It would be a shame if, if right when you have a chance to keep that legacy, you know, to let go of it. And uh, in my opinion, if we look at uh, the situation in general in the last, I would say, even 60, 70 years, it was amazing 
And sometimes small countries, when they showed courage and determination, uh, when they really tried to protect their dignity, they stood up to huge empires and they won. I mean, look at Cuba, a small Caribbean country which had been treated uh, like a servant by the United States for decades, simply proved that it can live without, without uh, any, any even without even lip service uh, paid to this uh, American domination. Uh, small countries such as Afghanistan, which uh, uh, simply refused uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, to be a, uh, in the Soviet sphere of influence. Small countries such as you just described New Zealand, which did not want to become a pawn in the Cold War. The same way Ecuador now has a unique chance to stand up to pressure and to stay in history, to remain in history. And I certainly hope that they do. I absolutely hope that they do. And I, I noticed there's been an extremely significant development now with the uh, ruling Spanish government, the um, Rajoy actually being essentially kicked out of power. Now, that, that's a total game changer, both on the Catalan issue and on the relationship with Ecuador and, and Julian's um, political commentary about both. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, we all remember the dramatic situation with Edward Snowden. You know, there were rumors that he would try to go to Cuba. There were rumors that he would try to go to Ecuador. Uh, ultimately, I think it was a good development that he stayed in Russia. Uh, look, now he is in security and he continues his work from here. Uh, uh, as for Ecuador, I mean, if Julian had been seeking refuge inside the country, okay, that would be dangerous for Ecuador. That would be kind of exposing Ecuador to the danger of a military operation by the United States. But Julian is at the embassy in London. He is not putting any people in danger by his action. What is required is just a little bit of courage from the Ecuadorian government, a little bit of willingness to do something beyond your daily interests. And then, and then you will be remembered for that, you know. That's how, that, that, that's, that is the difference between uh, what we can call significant people, you know, people, uh, who, who's, uh, people with capital letters, as we say in Russian, and, and just regular gray officials. You know, gray officials think about statistics, ratings, uh, about uh, the next uh, number of percent of the people who vote for them at the elections. Great people think about justice, about morals, about what is going to be said in 40, 50 or 60 years. In 40, 50 or 60 years, people are going to remember our epoch as the epoch of the people like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. They will be the young gooses and the Thomas More, Thomas Moores of our times. That has to be respected. That has to be kept uh, in mind uh, also by the Ecuadorian government. That is a really fantastic point as well, Dimitri, and it mirrors one that I'd made earlier about how powerful this moment is for those of us who support Julian Assange and who support WikiLeaks because we're not reading about them in a history book. We're not hearing about them in bedtime stories from our grandparents. We still have them. They are still with us, which means this is the moment that we have the power to change and to influence the outcome of these events, particularly around the persecution of Julian and to fight back against that persecution. True, true. And I would say that, uh, you know, uh, 100 years ago, writers such as Leo Tolstoy or Fyodor Dostoevsky, they played this kind of role because people were reading novels and, uh, and the novels in correspondence, uh, like uh, the works of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So they were important and these people are heroes. Now we live in the internet age when you can't really change a word by a novel, <laughs> but you can change a word by journalist research, by publishing uh, the secret documents that the authorities hide from the public. So Julian Assange is in a way a kind of Leo Tolstoy of our times, you know, 
he is helping us understand ourselves by modern methods, not by artistic invention, not by uh, invented stories, but by giving us the maximum of information that can be available. So can you imagine, uh, you know, some government delivering Leo Tolstoy to, to the, the Tsarist police? Can you imagine what would be said of a country, a Latin American country or an African country that would sur surrender Leon Feuchtwanger to, to the Nazis, to Hitler, or Erich Maria Remarque, or, or Bertolt Brecht? Uh, these countries would uh, cover themselves in shame for the next few decades, <laughs> that's for sure. So I think uh, if the UK uh, indeed arrests Assange and, and gives him to Sweden for further transfer to the United States, the UK will simply cover itself with, uh, uh, with shame. You know, it, it won't be the same, the same great country that we have been admiring for its legal system, for its old customs, for its nobility. It will simply have a very different image. Sorry, oh, yeah. I, was, I was I was muted. Sorry, Dimitri. Dimitri, um, I was I I was not old enough to really be across the situation with Britain um, offering shelter to Pinochet. Could you tell me a bit more about this history of terrible human rights abru abusers and even war criminals being sheltered by the same country that is now relentlessly persecuting a publisher? Well, uh, yes, General Pinochet was uh, in London. Uh, and uh, he was not arrested. He ended his days uh, not in a prison, as he should have done, but uh, in his own bed. Uh, but there were quite a few even more shocking examples. I mean, some of the people involved in terrorist activities in the uh, Russian Autonomous Republic of Chechnya in the 90s, some of them are living in the UK right now, and the UK simply refuses to consider any any requests from Russia for their extradition? Let me tell you that these are the same people. You know, they are from the same cradle, from the same ideology as the Tsarnaev brothers in Boston, who who killed and maimed uh, dozens of people during the Boston Marathon uh, a few years ago. Uh, let me remind you that at the time the Russian intelligence warned. Uh, the FBI that Tamerlan Tsarnaev was dangerous, that he had radical ideas, that he left Russia and became a U.S. citizen with not the best of intentions. But these considerations were simply rejected by the United States. And now uh, the U.K. is having on its territory someone who actually never used a weapon against other human beings, someone who only published who only typed something on a computer, and, and they want uh, to arrest this person and, and give him to uh, uh, what actually looks very much like torture in the United States. Well, let's remember in what conditions Bradley Manning had to sit in the US prison in the first years after his arrest. That was terrible, you know. Uh, I won't describe it, our readers can easily find it, even in the mainstream Western media, what kind of treatment it was. So it's understandable why Julian Assange is not leaving the Ecuadorian embassy. That is, that is a really important reminder. Right That's a really important reminder. And I remember that even one of Obama's um, White House press spokesman, wasn't it, uh, resigned over the treatment of Chelsea Manning. True, true. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the, the kind of treatment that Manning had to face was uh, was simply horrible, indecent. It was worse than Guantanamo, worse than Guantanamo. And, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's clear that Julian would be subjected to the same kind of treatment because uh, there is a precedent. There is a precedent. After all, uh, Bradley Manning, when he started his actions uh, in support of WikiLeaks, was a kind of, uh, you know, lawyer in the hierarchy to 
to Julian Assange. Assange was the organizer. So you can imagine what kind of treatment awaits uh, Julian Assange. And that is yet another extremely significant point and one that I've tried to make, which is that we saved Julian Assange's life, we will save the lives of countless other whistleblowers and at-risk journalists because Julian is one of the very few people in this world who has had a significant impact on the outcomes for whistleblowers and for at-risk journalists. You being a journalist, I'm really interested to know what your assessment is of the wider risk to press freedom were we to lose WikiLeaks. Well, I think that uh, the risks are not just uh, from uh, the governments, uh, which of course uh, do not always like uh, free press. Free press, that's nothing new. I think what is really awful is that uh, the prices which are now given, the, the amount of publicity that you receive is, is, is very unfair in the media world. I mean, the, the New York Times was given Pulitzer Prize, you know, their journalists were given Pulitzer Prize for the so-called Russia Gate scandal, even though now, uh, show me the people who were arrested because of Russia Gate. Show me a trial. <laughs> it has been two years since uh, Russia supposedly meddled in the US election. So, uh, and they get a Pulitzer Prize for that. Obviously, of course, Julian Assange, uh, under the current uh, conditions, will not get a, a, a journalist prize from international journalist organizations. Some of them will repeat Wesley Clark saying that he's not exactly a journalist, he did not have a press card, he did not finish any journalist schools, not a journalist, we don't know uh, what to do with him, right? But uh, this is simply ludicrous because people become journalists not because of their credentials. <laughs> people become journalists because they say something important. They say something important to the public. They say it by, uh, by all the means that are available to them, by, by television, by, by newspapers, or by internet, as Julian did it. So I, I think the, the, uh, the, the threat to press freedom, it's not only... A persecution, it's also the lack of attention from the mainstream press. Uh, you know, the, the modern world is trying to silence uh, uh, the, the activists and the journalists like Julian Assange by simply saying that they don't qualify to be journalists or they don't qualify to be politicians. It's like, uh, it's a very modern thing, you know, show me a document, show me an ID that would certify that you are someone. And unless you have that idea, you are no one, right? This kind of attitude we see practiced uh, with Julian by the mainstream media, and it's simply unfair because Julian Assange is known to uh, hundreds of thousands more, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of times more people than uh, the New York Times reporters who wrote about this nothing burger named Russia meddling in the US elections. Well, I mean, there's always been these shifting sands of different narratives that have been used to smear Julian Assange and to smear WikiLeaks. I think no matter what WikiLeaks released um, at any given time, that both the mainstream media and the government would be colluding to find a way to turn that narrative and use it against WikiLeaks. So I think um, the election has given them this narrative, but prior to that, there were other narratives. We've mm -hmm. seen many black. We've seen many black propaganda campaigns against WikiLeaks. In 2016, there was a um, a number of uh, suspicious uh, social media accounts pressing the idea that Julian wasn't even alive; that he was in fact dead. We've oh. seen this. We've seen the same thing in recent weeks where people are claiming that he's already left the embassy and is somehow in safety in the U.S. because Trump is going to save him. Uh, oh. I know from speaking with his mother, with his family, with his friends, and with his lawyers that that is completely untrue and not the case. He is trapped inside the Ecuadorian embassy. He is suffering multiple medical conditions that are of serious concern to his health and to his well-being. He is being deprived of his right, human right well, to communication. People who are talking about us uh, being conspiracy theorists, uh, 
people who say that, in fact, Julian is somewhere else besides the Ecuadorian embassy, they should look at their side of the barricade. I mean, the Ukrainian government, which is supported by the EU and by the United States, supported economically, financially, militarily, diplomatically, they have just faked a story of a murder of a journalist, uh, Arkady Babchenko. We have all seen this shameful, shameful spectacle that they put up in Kiev with, uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Babchenko lying in a, in a pool of, uh, I don't know what it was, maybe fruit juice, maybe pig blood, but he was there lying. And, and uh, immediately the prime minister of Ukraine, for God's sake, the prime minister, he wasn't informed about this uh, falsification. So he immediately accused what he called Russia's totalitarian machine of murdering this courageous person. So after you see the Western supported governments of being able to produce such lies to produce such falsifications, uh, please, please, you know, come to your senses and look for falsifications where they come from. They come from Washington, they come from Brussels, they come from Kiev, they come from London. They don't come from Julian Assange and from Moscow. If Julian Assange has fake, had faked just one message, you know, they would be after him uh, with, uh, with huge lawsuits, you know, they, they would uh, immediately destroy him morally. That was the point about Julian, that none, none of the government officials in the West is disputing the authenticity of his releases. Uh, what they try to do is just to shift attention, you know, shift attention from the things that really incriminate the governments of the West. I mean, when uh, WikiLeaks showed the video of Iraqi civilians being destroyed by the U.S. troops in, 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 in Iraq, they did not dispute the authenticity of the video. They just kept saying, could this video have a bad effect on the psyche of the people in Afghanistan that they may want to kill more American soldiers? Well, stop the war, you know, stop the killing of civilians. I'm sorry, not in Afghanistan, but in Iraq. Stop, stop the war, stop the killing of civilians in Iraq, and you won't have to fear for the lives of your soldiers. That was a very simple message from Julian Assange and his and his videos that he received, uh, that he released. And let me remind you that ultimately, uh, President Obama took most of the US troops out of Iraq. And we haven't seen any US agents exposed by Assange and, and being mistreated by anyone, including the Iraqi authorities. So it looks more and more likely that all of this talk about Assange revealing the identities of U.S. Uh, soldiers or U.S. agents, this talk is just empty talk. If they had one such a spy exposed, if they had one such person suffering, they would have shown him long ago. And, and his family or, or her family would go after Julian. There are simply no such agents who suffered because of Julian's activities. Absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. So what would you like to see happen from this point, Dimitri? Where, where, if you could wave a magic wand, where would you take the situation? Well, I hope uh, that uh, the UK government would finally uh, find some vestiges of shame and that they would say that after the newly revealed facts about Julian's stay in Sweden, uh, after the fact that uh, basically, as far as I know, no one is particularly demanding his extradition to Sweden. They, we just lift uh, the blockade and we let Julian, okay, maybe stay in the embassy or stay under house arrest, but we let him use the internet and we let him be a person living in normal human conditions. That would be the best uh, temporary solution. In future, I hope uh, that instead of going after uh, Assange, the Western government would try to improve their own policies, not to be exposed to the revelations of such people as Julian Assange. I also hope that people like Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who used to be given journalist prizes for publishing documents that the government didn't want them to publish, that they would recover at least the remnants of their moral integrity 
and they would proclaim Julian Assange for what he is, a journalist, one of their own, who just revealed a lot more documents uh, using the Sorry, Dimitri, I, my, Zoom, my Zoom just dropped out for a moment. Please continue. So uh, what I would see is, you know, as uh, uh, the, the, the Bolsheviks used to say, program maximum and program minimum. Program minimum <laughs> is for Julian to be given access to the Internet and to be given a chance to live, okay, maybe under house arrest, maybe under control, but as a normal human being and not as a track beast, right? That is the program minimum. The program maximum is for the US government to start a real re-examination of what uh, Julian and Wikileaks did and basically answer one question. Did they falsify the documents that, that they published? Was there any untruth told by them? If no, then the criminal charges against Julian and his friends should be dropped because what they did is not very different from what uh, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein did by publishing, you know, the truth about Watergate. It's the same story as Daniel Ellsberg publishing the so-called Pentagon Papers. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the United States prides itself on these people. It doesn't uh, try to put them in jail, you know, it doesn't put them to shame. It prides itself on these journalists in the same way uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, including Australia, should pride themselves on Julian Assange instead of persecuting him. That, I think, is a re very reasonable and rational way to approach it. Um, as you say, the program minimum and the program maximum, I completely agree. For us, the program minimum is definitely to reconnect Julian Assange, to, at the very least, sure. allow him to speak and work and express himself freely. And yes. I think absolutely the program maximum is to the restoration of all of his human rights, the end to his arbitrary detention, and the, his safe passage to Ecuador absolutely. or to Australia or a country of his, of his, of his choice. Absolutely. Um, he should be a free person, not, uh, not someone who is under conditions worse than the house arrest. I think people under house arrest are sometimes allowed to walk on fresh air, they're sometimes allowed to, to, to see their relatives, right? All of this should be given to Julian Assange, even on the program minimum. Totally great. Now, here's a different question. Where do you see this going forward? Where, what, I mean, you obviously have a huge depth of historical knowledge. Where do you believe that ultimately this will be resolved? If so, how do you think it will be resolved? Are there multiple different potential outcomes? Could you just look into a crystal ball for us for, mm -hmm. for a few minutes? To meet well, you? as I as I told our listeners in the beginning, uh, I blame for what's going on. I don't I don't blame the United States as a nation. I don't blame uh, the British people as a nation. I don't blame the uh, you rule Europe, uh, which is our spiritual mother. I blame the ultra-liberal, aggressive ideology, which took the hefty, sacred ideas of liberalism and which twisted them beyond recognition, drive them, driving them to an extreme. I am sure that this ideology, just like all the other ideologies, uh, totalitarian ideologies before it, just like Nazism and communism, it will go down into the dustbin of history. Uh, the main danger is that before going down there, it can pull together with itself a lot of innocent lives. It already dragged into the death zone hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, tens of thousands of Afghans, a few thousands of uh, Russians and Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine. That ideology will soon be defeated. It doesn't work. It's not scientific. It is losing economic competition. Uh, look at the Eurozone, which has so many problems despite being the most economically developed zone in the Earth historically. So uh, I, I think that this ideology will lose. Uh, the main point is, 
it should lose gently it should collapse without burying people under its debris uh, we had a similar experience with the soviet union the soviet union which was indeed a totalitarian state during most of its existence the soviet union collapsed in the 90s and it took us a few years to get from under its debris uh, in the same way uh, i hope that uh, the united states uh, regime which is ruling that country now uh, the eu uh, they're not forever they will go down from the scene of history uh, ju i just don't want uh, julian assange to be missed treated and tortured before that happens. I want him to see the day when his ideals will become a reality. Uh, I think this will absolutely, I'm absolutely sure that this will happen and not uh, in a distant future, as a lot of people think it may happen very soon. We already see fissures between the United States and the European Union between these two uh, very dangerous ideological formations. Uh, so hopefully things will get better before Julian gets old. That's what I can tell you. <laughs> well, I really hope so too. Very much so, because I am extremely concerned. I'm, as I said earlier, I'm concerned not just for Julian, but also for all of the people who will be negatively impacted um, if, if we lose him. Uh, likewise with WikiLeaks as an organization. I completely agree with you that in 10 years, 15 years time, just as happened with Dr. Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and so many other people who the US government called national security threats, called terrorists, terrorists. Yeah. absolutely, <laughs> who they stalked and surveilled and undermined and in some cases assassinated they then very conveniently turn around after the fact and call them heroes and institute, you know, national holidays to celebrate some In limited, their honor. Yes. Some limited well, aspect of their work. Um, but, yeah, the, this is a, a grave concern to me. I mean, this was a focus of my recent piece, Being Julian Assange, which is the way that the historical record is uh, manipulated and um, re-engineered by mm -hmm. the, the persecutors of the target. And, and that's, something, that's something we've seen throughout history and something that I desperately do not want to see happen with WikiLeaks. Well, you're right. I think uh, it would be much better to, to uh, do something for leaving Julian Assange instead of introducing days in his memory and putting up balloons uh, on the day uh, in future to celebrate his achievement, uh, you know, in, in future. Uh, we should be uh, cherishing and, and safeguarding and protecting our heroes now when they're still alive. Uh, if, if we can do it now, that will count for a lot more than honoring uh, the great dead man, you know, the great dead already had their share of fame. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, that nowadays our civilization is facing threats no smaller than the ones it was facing in the 1920s or 1930s. It all depends on us uh, how safe uh, the world will be for us and for our children in, in five or 10 years. We need to do more to make it safer. And if we can't protect Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, then we're worthless. And actually, uh, our descendants will say that these people could not protect their best. If they could not protect their best, they probably deserved if something bad happened to them later. I completely agree. Now, can you give me a historical precedent for a successful outcome? Is there any hope? Uh, can you give me a historical precedent for a successful outcome? Mm. Well, I can give you uh, such a uh, precedent. Uh, professor, uh, academician Andrei Sakharov, the great physicist, spent about six years in, uh, under house arrest, in fact, uh, in, in the city of Gorky under the Soviet Union. And uh, in six years, he was greeted as a hero in Moscow. And now we have a 
a huge street in Moscow named after him. And we have a museum in his name. All of that happened quite unexpectedly, you know. In 1980, he was put under house arrest. In 1986, he was met as a hero at a train station in Moscow. And in six months, he was already sitting in the Soviet parliament arguing with Gorbachev. So things may change in a matter of months, uh, sometimes even weeks. Let's hope that this will be the case also with Julian Assange. That just reminds me that we have another what's shaping up to be a successful horror, um, historical precedent, which is uh, the case in Malaysia currently, where the persecuted opposition leader is now being let out of jail and is likely to stand for election and to win, uh, supposedly even with the cooperation of the current sitting um, leader who had, in fact, been party to that persecution. Well, I mean, uh, actually, if you look at the 20th century, I can give you dozens of such examples. Kim Dae-jun, I think the most successful president of South Korea. Who is he? A former uh, student leader, a former anti-authoritarian uh, campaigner. Uh, he became the president of South Korea. Uh, Nelson Mandela, I mean, we, we, have, we know about him a lot now, but in 1962, he was considered a terrorist. And, uh, and it was prohibited for the U.S. citizens and for the citizens of the U.K. to have any contact with him. Uh, other examples, you know, there are lots of them. I just don't want to, to kind of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the founder of modern India, Jawaharlal Nehru, <laughs> he was persecuted by the British authorities in much the same way as Julian Assange now. So, I, I mean, I can be giving you examples for, for hours. Uh, Menachem Begin, you know, also, also wanted by the British government for many years. <laughs> I mean, the same story, just names are different. That's fascinating, very fascinating to hear. Um, I, this knowledge is, is really beyond me, so it's, it's quite a unique experience for me to be able to learn from you, Dimitri, not just to interview you, but but to really learn from you. Um, one more thing I would like to know, on this topic of geopolitics, uh, one of the most fascinating learning experiences of my life was watching Julian Assange's TV show, The World Tomorrow. Uh, I want to know, did you watch that series? And if so, what did you think of it? Because uh, for my, my interpretation, uh, Julian managed to secure interviews with uh, people who we just never, ever, ever see in Western in Western media ever. You know, the leader of Hezbollah being a classic example. But he did a Julian did a great job of um, taking these very significant, very controversial, and very persecuted figures from countries all around the world, from Egypt, from Malaysia, from Lebanon, and then having these very down to earth and insightful conversations with them. So please, I'd love to know. Did you see it? Pardon me. Did you see it? And well, what was your what, what was your takeaway from it? I saw that particular interview with uh, the leader of Hezbollah. Uh, I think you, um, you mean Nasrallah. Sheikh Nasrallah. Um, yes, Sheikh Nasrallah. I, I think it was fascinating, and uh, I must tell you that I, I have to admit I had a very negative opinion about Hezbollah uh, and about the Shiite uh, resistance in general in Lebanon. Uh, because my generation of uh, uh, young journalists in, in Russia in the 1980s, 1990s, we were pretty sympathetic with Israel for obvious reasons. We went against, against the, established, the established view uh, in the Brezhnev Soviet Union that Israel was to blame for everything, uh, that uh, the Arab countries uh, were, uh, you know, uh, were very nice and innocent. But in the case of Lebanon, Israel is certainly on the wrong side of history. I'm sorry, you know. Lebanon in 1982 became a victim of, uh, of an Israeli invasion. Even, even the Israeli politicians acknowledge it. They call it Israel's Vietnam, you know, that war in 1982. So it was then that Hezbollah appeared as a response to the Israeli military action. And uh, the fact that Sheikh Nasrallah 
uh, wears his Muslim clothes, the fact that he doesn't look exactly like your typical European uh, uh, leader in a, in, a, in a nice suit and without a beard and nicely shaven and uh, uh, with a good uh, haircut. Mr. Nasrava is a person of his epoch in the place where he lives in Lebanon. Uh, and Hezbollah, uh, what it did in the last few years was basically self-defense. It was self-defense against Israel in 2006. It was self-defense against uh, the Islamists uh, in, uh, on the Syrian territory uh, after the civil war broke out in, 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 in Syria in 2011-2012. So Julian Assange has shown us a, a person whom we all heard about, but whom we didn't actually uh, hear speaking to us. Sheikh Nasrawa spoke to all of us via Julian Assange. Hello. And Dima, just one last question for you, because our, ne our next guest is here and we're a little bit behind schedule now, but I do just want to ask you, what does it say about Ju uh, Julian's chops as a journalist that someone like Nisrallah, who would never, ever appear in Western press, would sit and do an hour-long video interview with Julian? Well, there is that Robin Hood effect, you know. People love uh, campaigners for truth and justice. Uh, in every religion, in every region of the world, you have people admiring uh, Robin Hoods, and not necessarily their local Robin Hoods, but also Robin Hoods from other parts of the world. So Sheikh Nasrallah, who has reasons to distrust the mainstream press in the West, had trust in Julian Assange, with Julian Assange remaining a Western person, you know, a person brought up in Australia, uh, not very different initially in his views and opinions from an average Australian, from an average uh, inhabitant of a Western country. So I think it was interesting for Sheikh Nasrallah to talk to Assange because uh, all the interesting men, they're not afraid of meeting people of different culture, different language, they kind of test their own authenticity, their own rightness, talking to interesting people from other parts of the world. I know that feeling, and I'm very glad that both Julian Assange and Sheikh Nasrallah did not miss that opportunity to show each other to the world. That is just a brilliant close to this because that is so true. I mean, we talk about Julian's significance in terms of WikiLeaks releases. We talk about his significance in, in terms of, um, you know, providing support to whistleblowers and to journalists and to say, really saving lives. But this is yet another element of it that he's also used his platform, his experience and his relationships to bring these voices into the public realm that otherwise might never have been there and to truly show us the other side of the story. Thank you so much you. for being with us, Dima. It is an absolute pleasure, and I deeply appreciate it. There is countless comments in the YouTube chat absolutely lauding you for your contribution and Thank for the you. way some, you, someone, said, someone said, what a brilliant educator to have on the stream, and that, that is the role that you have played for us today. You have been very educational. So thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, friends. State fighting. <laughs> Bye.